Okay, welcome to another Ginger Mathematician video. So I'm going to go through the start of the IB High Level Applications topic on graph theory. So this can be basically basic definitions, uh, what path is, what a cycle is, what kind of cycles there are, um, looking at weighted graphs, things like that, and then we'll look at adjacent matrices right at the end. So it's a kind of whistle-stop tour through all the language used in graph theory and then we'll look at some examples of adjacent matrices. So, you're probably familiar with the word graph with reference to Cartesian coordinates working in X and Y. Uh, I've given some examples of quadratic or uh, linear. But in graph theory, the term has a very different meaning. So, a graph in graph theory sense is essentially points, i.e. nodes, and connected by lines, which are known as edges or arcs. So, if you look at the example in the PowerPoint here, you will see that you've got your nodes. Here's B is a node, F is a node, D is a node, of course, whereas the lines from F to E or E to F or F to H, they would be called edges or arcs. Okay, so that's an example of a graph. Now, we use these in real life all the time without realizing it. For example, and that's one other point to be made, actually, that the distance between the two points, um, that doesn't really matter, it's just what's connected to what. That is what the most important thing is. And we see this all the time, as I was saying. So, for example, if you take the tube map, you can see here that if I were to go from Shepherd's Bush, for example, to Harrow, how do I do this? I want to find an efficient route. We'll be talking about that in a later video. But that's one example where we see this all the time in any metro system, any tube system, any Urban system, we see this all the time. Um, we also use this for problem solving. So say you have a charity shop and you have a certain number of people that can only work certain days, then you need to try and figure out, okay, how can we work out um, an ideal model so everybody works when they can, so to speak. And we use this kind of idea. So we've got our A, B, C, D, E representing Mr. Ahmed, Mr. Brown, Miss Candy, Ms. Davis, and Mrs. Evans. And then we've got, on the other side, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then we simply connect up some of the nodes with the um, appropriate arcs. And you can see, as you can see from the animation here, that we get some kind of graph. And we'll talk about the connective, connectiveness, so to speak, uh, when a graph is connected, not connected, things like this. Um, also, architects use this all the time in terms of uh, designing houses, designing buildings, and we can model this also using a graph. So, notice here that these gaps here are representing the doors. So there's a door from the garage to the utility room, whereas for the kitchen there are doors to the leisure room, the hall and the dining room. And this can be represented as a circulation graph, where we've labelled these things sensibly, utility room, UR, leisure room, LR, and so on. And you can see that the hall, for example, is uh, well connected with a lot of the other nodes in the diagram. Okay, so some more basic definitions. So a path is a finite, so that's important, so it has to finish. Finite sequence of edges, such as the end vertex of one edge in the sequence is the start vertex of the next. So, for example, if we take the path A, B, F, H, that is a path, FCAH is a path, or BFED, they're all paths, okay, so going, it's kind of intuitive really, okay, it's just a route around a graph, okay, um, is the edge AF a path, well, I'll let you think about that, um, is that really a path or not? A cycle, however, is a closed path, so it makes um, a full cycle, so to speak. So, for example, if you take A, B, F, H, A, that would be a cycle. But A, B, C, D, E, F, H, A is also a cycle, but it has to close, basically. That's the idea there. Many different cycles. F, C, D, E, F is a cycle, many cycles. A Hamiltonian cycle is a very special kind of cycle, and that's that passes through every vertex of the graph once and only once, and returns back to its start vertex. So, if you take A, B, C, D, E, F, H, A, 
that's a Hamiltonian cycle. We've visited every um, node once and we've returned back to A. Whereas if we did A, B, C, D, E, F, B, A, that wouldn't be Hamiltonian because one, we've missed H out and also we've been to B twice. Okay, and I'll let you think if you can find another Hamiltonian cycle. Okay, and like I'm going to talk about with Eulerian or uh, Eulerian uh, cycles as well, sometimes it's not always possible, and we'll talk about what features are needed in the graph to make it possible in a later video. A Eulerian cycle is the same kind of idea, but instead of the focus on nodes, we've got the focus on edges. So it's a cycle that includes every edge of a graph exactly once. So can you find a Eulerian cycle? One well, of my students definitely did. I didn't think there was one, but there are many actually Eulerian cycles in this particular example. Again, not always possible to find a Eulerian cycle. Um, it's named after a Swiss mathematician called Leonhard Euler. Euler meaning owl in German. So that's where the name comes from. Um, I try and pronounce it the British way, Eulerian rather than Eulerian, which is a more German way of saying the same thing. Okay, a vertex set is simply the set of all vertices on a graph. So we use our set notation with the curly brackets. And we say the vertex set is simply, we take all the nodes and then put them into a set. So A, B, C, D, E, F, and H make up our vertex set. And we can do a similar thing with an edge set as well. So it's a set of all edges on a graph. So we write down A, B, B, C, C, D. But you need to make sure you include every single edge and don't forget one. So remember, A, C is also an edge as well going across. A subgraph, kind of like a subset in Venn diagrams, for example. A subset is a simply vertices together with a subset of edges. So it's a graph within a graph, so to speak. So if we take this red graph here, then the subset of vert vertices would be A, B, F, H, the vertices in the red, and the edges would be A, B, B, F, F, H, and A, H. So it's a graph within a graph, which has a certain number of vertices and a certain number of edges edges. Um, here's another one. So this is a slightly larger subgraph, but again we just identify all the nodes in the subgraph itself, the vertices, so A, B, C, D, E, and F, and then we highlight all the edges. Okay. Connected. So two vertices are officially connected if there is a path in G between them. So if we look at this, well, A and C are connected because there is a path to get from A to C. Uh, in fact, we could have taken A to B to C, or A to F to C, or even A, C directly. A and D are connected because we've got the root down the bottom, so A, H, F, E, D. That makes them connected. Okay, and a graph in total is connected if all pairs of its vertices are connected. So if we check that AC are connected, AE is connected, AD is connected, AF is connected, and you'll see this graph is a connected graph. However, G2, well, this graph is obviously not connected because we can't get from E to B, for example. There is no path to actually take us from E to B. Simple graph. A simple graph is defined as a graph in which there are no loops and not more than one edge connecting any pair of vertices. So this graph here, for example, is a simple graph. Whereas we can make this unsimple or not simple by adding loops. So a loop, as you can see on the left hand side, is where the same vertex is at each end. So kind of obvious from the word loop. Or if you've got two edges connecting the same two nodes, like D and E, for example. So this graph, for two good reasons, is not simple because of D and E being connected twice and the loop at A. The degree or valency or order is the number of edges connected to a vertex. So if we take A, for example, we have four because we've got one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four edges going into that vertex. Whereas if we take D, for example, you'll notice that we've got, well, only one, 
or two edges coming out of there. And of course, even and odd works in the normal way. So B and F with three and five are odd vertices, whereas A, H, C, D and E are even vertices because they have an even valency or degree. A digraph or direction graph, as it's known, is the edges have a direction associated with them. Okay, and they're known as directed edges. So we have to consider the arrow, the direction in which the route is going more carefully. And I generally call it a directed graph. A digraph is the shortened version. So G4, of course, is a directed graph. And graphs, particularly with digraphs, are very useful ways of picturing relationships between objects. However, if there's a lot of information there, then it can be quite complicated and we need another form to represent the same information. Now, generally we can use a list or we can use, if you've done matrices before, a matrix is often a very powerful tool for understanding these kind of graphs. So let's take this unsimple graph. We talked about why this is unsimple. Think of the two reasons this is an unsimple graph. Okay, well, run one reason is we have a loop at C, so you can see there's a loop C, and also A and D, they're connected twice, so that makes it not simple. So G5 is not a simple graph. Now, if we take G5 as a list, so we essentially write the vertex set and the edge set, you can see we write A, B, C, D, E for the vertices, and then the edge, you can see A, B, and B, C, and A, D twice, in fact, yep, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. However, we can write this as a matrix. So this is known as an adjacent matrix. So if I look at, let's take the pen, here for example, well, okay, um, A to A or B to B, okay, there's no way of getting to itself, so to speak. Whereas if we take C, actually, there are two edges coming out of there. So for C and C, there's actually two because of this loop here. But what this is telling us is, okay, how many ends of an edge are coming out of one vertex and going into another? Well, with A to B, well, we've only got one there, haven't we? Whereas from A to D, we've got one, but we've got two. If we take A to E, then we've got one there. Whereas to A to C, there is no direct uh, edge that goes from A to C, which is why we call this zero here. Okay, and if we take D to A, well, because there's no digraph, there's no direction, well, it's going to be a reflection of A to D. This is why this is 2 and this is 2. And you'll see this kind of uh, reflective nature of the matrix itself, which if you've done any study on matrices, um, this kind of diagonalization is very, very powerful within matrices. Okay, let's move on. So for a digraph, of course, your matrix will change uh, somewhat because the direction of the line gets taken into account. So you see now the order of the letters is important. Okay, so having DC specifically, EC specifically is important. And your matrix now, you'll see, is much more simplistic because um, you're only counting the direction. So for example, A to D is a good example of this. To go from A to D, We've got one, two ways of getting there. Whereas if we go from D to A, well, we have to uh, respect the direction. And so there is no way directly to get from D to A, which is why we put zero here. We may have a graph that with a mixture of directed edges and undirected edges. That is possible. So this is a good graph. So B to C, for example, does not have a direction and neither does this particular edge of A to D. So I've got a matrix here for you. So from A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Pause the video if you need to. Can you fill out the matrix, the adjacent matrix for G7 here? Okay, so hopefully you found an answer to that. I'm going to leave that with the knowledge you've picked up from the last 10 minutes of video. You should be able to answer that. I will do an example of a matrix right at the end as well. Right, on to more definitions. I mean, graph theory at the start is 
just full of definitions, basically. Um, let's talk about special kinds of graphs. So a tree is a connected graph. Okay, so all the nodes are connected, but there's no cycles between them. So it kind of looks like a tree. So for example, to get from D to F, well, I can get to D to F through B, C, and E. I can go from A to G through B, C, E, and G. So it's definitely connected, but there's no cycle so I can get back to my point. So apart from going backwards. So to go D, B, C, E, G, but there's no way of getting back to D from G. So that's why we have no cycles. Okay, and here's another example as well. Okay. So G8 is a tree, but G9 is not a tree because there is that cycle. So because G to D can be connected, um, that means it's not a tree. So we always have to look for any cycle, and that will show whether it is a tree or not. And plenty of examples in real life of trees. Uh, this is one. So in the United States, the upper Mississippi River system, you'll see that works in a tree fashion, going through um, those states there from south to north. Uh, a tree that I'm sure everyone's very familiar with. So a probability tree. We use that to calculate uh, probabilities of two or more events. We use a tree for that. We'd have no cycle, so to speak. It would make no sense in probability. And of course, a family tree. So a family tree um, works without any cycle. You can't go from, if you take the Bible, for example, you can't go from Ishmael, for example, and go straight back to Cain. It doesn't work that way, of course, because of time. And of course, the filing system in a computer as well. Okay, It works in a tree-like fashion. You can't cycle round from the wedding and then go straight back to the dusty picks to process. Yeah? It doesn't make any sense. So a spanning tree uh, specifically, and in my next video I will talk about a minimum spanning tree, is a subgraph of a graph G that includes all the vertices of G, but is also a tree as well. So if I take this part here, for example, um, this is a good example of a spanning tree. Okay, so it's definitely a subgraph because you've got the vertices, but it doesn't include, or the edges doesn't include the entire graph. This is true. But it is um, a tree. There is no cycle you can go around to get back to the beginning again. A complete graph, another definition, is a graph in which every vertex is connected by an edge to each of the other vertices. So, okay. There we are. Okay. So, if the graph has n vertices, then it's de denoted by k n subscript n. So we take these uh, three examples here, for example. This is a complete graph because every vertex is connected by an edge to each of the other vertices. So for example, K4, our rectangle, well, this is connected here to here and to here. And you get this lovely shape here with the pentagon. You notice each vertex is connected with the other, which gives you this kind of star in the middle. Those examples are complete graphs. Okay, a bipartite graph, this goes a little bit beyond uh, graph theory for the IB course, but a bipartite graph consists of two sets of vertices, X and Y, and the edges only join vertices in X to vertices in Y, not within a set. And it's probably better to just show you a picture of this, for example. So if you've got set X and set Y, like we saw in a previous example with Mr. Ahmed and Mrs. Brown, etc., you'll notice this is a bipartite graph because, yeah, these A, B, C, D, E, they do not connect with each other, only on the other side. If you've done any function work with injective functions, surjective functions, this kind of fits in with that theme as well. And a complete bipartite graph is when you've got R and R vertices in X and S vertices in Y. Okay, every vertex in X is connected to every vertex in Y. So, give an example of that. Then you've got a graph like this. You'll notice every single vertex on this side is connected with every vertex here. 
and vice versa, the other way around. So M is connected with A and B and C and D, and N is connected with A and B and C and D. And we use this notation of K42 to represent, okay, this is our four nodes here in our first set, and then our two nodes here in our second set. Okay, and a planar graph is a graph that can be drawn in a plane, such that no two edges meet each other except at a vertex. So, for example, this graph here would be described as planar. Again, not really in the IB course, but I thought I'd show it here as well. So I'll skip over this quickly. And this is what I wanted to move on to. This is much more in the IB course. A network graph or weighted graph, I generally use weighted graph, is a graph which has a number associated with each edge. Usually it's called its weight. And that becomes important when we look at more real-life applications. So, for example, if we take some small towns in England, for example, the numbers represent the distance between those particular towns. So it's 28 miles, I think it's probably done in miles, I would think, from Warminster to Salisbury, but to get from Salisbury to Dorchester is 40 miles. But you'll notice the distance on the graph doesn't matter, it's what's the number on there that makes the difference. And we can, of course, use this and put this in matrix form. So, for example, from Warminster to Swindon. So, if we go Warminster to Swindon, it's 37. And because it's not a digraph or directed graph, you'll notice that it's the same over here. So, you have this kind of line of symmetry that goes down the middle, like so. If we had directed graphs, obviously, this would change somewhat. Okay, and let's just finish off. We're actually going to do some adjacent matrices. So we're going to actually make an adjacent matrix for these two examples. So let's do the first one. Well, first of all, what's the size of our matrix going to be? Well, we've got four vertices, and it's always a square matrix. Therefore, it's going to be a 4 by 4 matrix. So 4 by 4. So let's set this up and give us lots of room. Okay, and now we need to think, okay, which matrix connects, oh, sorry, which node connects with the other? So we have zeros down the middle, because A connects up with A zero times, so to speak. We're at the point where it is, so zero, zero, zero. And then we think, okay, how many ways to get from A to B? Well, that's going to be one. How many ways from A to C? Well, zero. A to D also zero. We start at B. So how many ways to get from B to A? Well, that's 1. And how many ways from B to C? Well, that's also 1. And B to D, also 1. And then we look at C. How many ways to get from C to A? Well, that's going to be 0. How many ways from C to B? That's 1. How many ways from C to D? Well, here, but also here as well. Definitely not a simple graph. And then for D, how many ways from D to A? Well, that's going to be 0, D to B, that's going to be 1, and finally, D to C is also 2 as well. So again, this symmetry is very typical of any graph that's not a digraph, basically, like our second example. So we've got five vertices, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so we need a very big matrix, a 5 by 5 matrix, and we can put zeros down the middle, in the same way we did before, so 0, 0, 0, 0. And let's just go through these very quickly. So if we start at, hmm, which one should we start with? So if we take T, for example, yeah, T can only go, or should we start alphabetical? P, Q, R, S. Hmm. Let's go alphabetical. So you do need to know one's which, so let's go P, Q, R, S, and T. So how do we go from P to Q? Well, that's zero. And we go from P to R, that's also zero. How do we go from P to S? Well, we've got only one way to get there. You can go both directions, it's allowed. And then P to T is also one. Let's go now to Q. So how to get from Q to P? Well, that's zero. Q to Q, Q to R, well that's also zero because we can only go one direction. And then Q to S is one, and Q 
q to t is only zero. And we do the same method all the way through. Let me just fill it in for you. So zero, one, zero, zero, zero. And s is one, zero, one, zero, zero. And our last one is zero, one, zero, one, zero. And we have our adjacent matrix. Okay, so in IP high level, you'll be expected to be able to make an adjacent matrix of any graph, digraph, or otherwise um, on your course. And we'll see in the next video where that comes in useful when we look at some matrix calculation with these matrices. Okay, bye bye for now.